Let's let's. Morning, everyone. This is the May 2022 meeting for the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. We're on Zoom. Uh, we have a quorum to begin, and I'll start with the land acknowledgement. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiamu people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. So good morning to everyone. Um, I'll start by noting that uh, we're working from an amended agenda that Jackie sent out a couple days after the uh, first round of agendas. So uh, if you're looking at that on your screen, um, please uh, please make sure you're looking at the right uh, plan for the for the day. So the meeting's called to order. I think the first item on the agenda is uh, an update on the Justice Project work uh, under the auspices of the County Council. We have Council Member Buchanan uh, here. I'm searching for him on my screen. Um, there he is. Hi, Barry. Hey, uh, good. Uh, this is your report. Take it away. Yeah. Um, thanks, Stephen. Uh, and good morning, everybody. I just wanted to give you a little brief update on what's going on with the uh, Justice Project and the needs assessment. Not much has changed since I reported out last month. Uh, there is one more uh, a meeting with the subcommittee is going to happen tomorrow. And thanks to uh, Councilmember Hamill and Mike Parker for w being uh, willing to host those and uh, keep our folks informed. That's really what we're trying to do right now is really get everybody up to speed. Um, there's a lot of folks that haven't been associated with any of the subject matter at all. So uh, we've been having them come out to all the <clears throat> subcommittee meetings through March. Um, and, and then we had our April SAC meeting number two, which was on criminal justice data. Uh, we're looking forward to our meeting in June. Uh, we have uh, our behavioral health team, some of which are here on this call this morning, have been working diligently to put together a, an inventory and a gap analysis of some of our behavioral health uh, programs and needs and looking at that in, in terms of you know, how that relates to our criminal justice system and our jail population. So that's about it for today. Um, again, tomorrow would be at two o'clock will be the behavioral health meeting with uh, the stakeholder advisory committee folks being able to attend and uh, they'll get another, another good piece of information out of that. So that's it, Stephen. Great, thank you, Barry. Any questions for Barry at this moment? Okay. Um, oh, Dan, sorry. Yeah, just wondering if you can clarify for the benefit of the folks on the call, the difference between, or some definitions are being thrown around here, Justice Project. Sometimes we're referred to, the, the, we're referred to as the Law and Justice Council. And I just wanna uh, clarify for, for folks that might not understand the difference between um, those. Yeah, the, the Justice Project itself was the whole project of looking at the uh, potential new correctional facility. So that includes a lot of the work that's going on in the executive's office and the sheriff's office. Um, then the needs assessment, of course, is a big, huge part of that. So it's not that the Justice Project is the law and Justice Council. That's not quite accurate. However, we as this body are the Law and Justice Council. And since we're heavily involved in this project, I, I would say that uh, there's definitely a connection between the two entities. But when you hear the Justice Project, it is the, the needs assessment and the work that's going on uh, by staff looking at this issue. 
Barry, this is Jack. I think uh, we had some discussions about this because as we called it SAC, Stakeholders Advisory Committee, it was so generic that it had no uh, resonance with justice at all. And I think, Barry, is it fair to say we're still not quite sure? Have we settled on justice project to call what we're doing finally? Well, I think we haven't thought, we haven't come up, come up with any other ideas. So I think that's where we're at now. I, I think it's where we're at, but is it fair to say, Barry, that SAC and Justice Project are synonymous if you hear those terms? Well, there's no, that's not quite not, not correct. Okay. The SAC is certainly a big effort as part of the Justice Project. So the like I said, Justice Project also involves a lot of the work that's being done in the sheriff's office and the executive's office and at the staff level. Um, but the the set the the actual needs assessment is where the stakeholder advisory committee comes in as an advisory committee to the council for that. Perfect. Well, got it. Because if I was slightly confused, I'm sure others are too. We've got a lot of terms. Yeah, Thanks. that's right. That's right. So the Justice Project is the overarching entity, and <clears throat> the SAC is a part of that. Exactly. It's the whole the whole concept of looking at our correctional facility needs is 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 the Justice Project. So it entails you know, more than just the stakeholder advisory committee. Okay, thanks for clarifying. I think it's important uh, to have those definitions out there for, for everybody um, because it's there's a lot of very similar similar words floating around and the, the uh, Justice Project is such an important um, entity in our community now that I wanna make sure that it's very well-defined. Thanks. Yeah, we, just need, we need to do a little bit better job of branding that, I think. I think Jack's right. Thanks for bringing that up, Dan, and thank you, Barry. Um, Jack, if you don't mind, I'll introduce, I'll introduce the next topic, and then you can take a couple after that. Sure, you take the budget, and I'll then start with committee update. Sounds great. Oh, oh, the, oh, or is that what you meant? Or I know, I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't have the uh, agenda in front of me. I thought we were going to lead, but oh, um, I may be using the wrong agenda. <laughs> no, you, you, you may not. Jill, Jill, would you, would you throw is, the agenda up there, please? Is our agenda is item number three, 2023, 20, 2024 20, budget, or are we? Am I looking at the wrong one? Oh yeah, I have the wrong budget. Go ahead, Barry, or, or go ahead, Stephen. Yep, I've okay. got the previous agenda. Okay. Well, if if Dan's question didn't clarify that we're uh, sort of tripping over each other, threading together all these conversations in different venues, um, this one may also. Tomorrow afternoon, the, uh, the meeting that uh, Dan and Mike are facilitating, uh, with the Behavioral Health Committee for SAC members uh, will include a presentation by uh, Laura Christensen and Tommy McAuliffe on uh, the Response Services Division. It will also include some presentations by uh, Prosecutor Eric Ritchie and Superior Court Judge Lee Grockmull. So it, it's, it will be an overview of some of the uh, behavioral health aspects uh, across the justice system. Um, but this morning, I particularly invited Melora and Tommy to present on LEAD itself. And just as a bit of background to this, um, Tommy, uh, uh, I can't remember if Melora was at that meeting or not. Tom Tommy uh, attended a meeting of the pretrial processes work group and talked a little bit about uh, lead and what he was describing was a little bit different than the model that Seattle had created that we had adopted uh, that we'd been funded for and that I, I thought was still in place and and it has it has morphed out of necessity and out of uh, uh, nimbleness uh, by the staff in response to community needs um, but when I talked to Tommy afterwards it was uh, clear that there had been enough change in my mind that that I thought the task force would benefit from from understanding how lead is operating now uh, what the changes have been since it was initiated why those changes were put in place and uh, what they saw coming up in the near future and Melora and Tommy very generously agreed to give us some time this morning to talk about those uh, in addition to the presentation they're gonna to make tomorrow afternoon. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to both Melora and Tani, Tommy um, to uh, talk about LEAD and uh, answer any questions we all have. And thank you both for being with us this morning. I appreciate your, your carving out some time from your schedules. Hey, thanks for the uh, introduction, Stephen. I appreciate it. 
Um, we also actually have a PowerPoint for everyone today, just to kind of provide an overview of what we've been doing and um, really a in-depth look at lead from the operational level. So Melora, are you okay sharing that? Yes, I'm happy to cool. share the PowerPoint and uh, we have a video at one point, so I'll have to stop and then share again. So just thank you for your patience. Um, and just one quick correction, Stephen, I know everything's new, but um, the new division at the health department is the response systems division instead of services. And um, so LEAD is one of the programs that are now uh, in the health department. So Tommy will be jumping into all of that and uh, I will we'll both be available for questions after the presentation. Thanks, Melora. And while Melora's getting that ready, um, I'll just, obviously Stephen provided a great introduction, but uh, Tommy McAuliffe, I am the program supervisor for uh, Whatcom County's Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. In the efforts of time, I'll just be saying LEAD. Um, sorry for the acronym, but it just makes it a lot faster. <laughs> um, and then Melora Christensen. Um, Melora is our new response systems division manager. Cool. All right. You ready, Melora? We'll get it. Tommy, were you able to see that? Um, I can just see the slides, the whole layout of the slides. I can't actually see it in slideshow mode. Hmm. Laura, this is Jack. I saw it. Uh, I think you have to hit from current slide or from the beginning, the upper left in PowerPoint, and that should work. Yeah, I thought we. Does that work for everybody? You hit the right thing and it didn't do it. And it didn't do it. Hmm. You know, one second. Sorry, everybody. Let's try this again. How about now? Perfect. Great. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, Melora. So just a brief overview of really what LEAD is. Um, for those of you who don't know, LEAD is really a voluntary program that's really been dedicated towards intervening in the lives of individuals who are having that frequent interaction with law enforcement as well as the criminal legal system. Um, really how we're intervening is through intensive case managers currently. Uh, Lee's been operational since September 2020. Our program obviously runs out of Whatcom County Health Department's response systems division. And really what our team construct looks right now is we are fully staffed with four intensive case managers as well as one outreach coordinator. Uh, each intensive case manager has a caseload capacity of about 15 to 20 clients. And we try and meet with each client approximately about once a week, hence that term intensive case management. When we're looking at the primary job duties of lead intensive case managers, it really right now is looking like providing a helping hand to clients that are immersed in the criminal legal system. Um, really helping clients connect with their defense attorney, um, helping the client get to court, really while also helping that client connect with individuals with more common social service needs and being able to um, provide them with social service needs, including housing, transportation, uh, behavioral health and substance use treatment. A lot of times social support and interaction, really someone to talk to about the challenges that they're facing. When we're looking at the population we're serving, LEAD is currently serving 80 clients and the majority of our clients are really facing extreme poverty and the majority of them also are really in need of transportation assistance. Um, I'll also note that over 80% of the population we're serving is currently experiencing homelessness within Whatcom County. And as a fun fact for everyone, um, over on the first quarter of 2022, from the beginning of January to the end of March, uh, lead intensive case managers helped clients really make a total of 104 connections to existing local services. So that could look like substance use treatment, behavioral health treatment, um, helping an individual uh, obtain a birth certificate, things like that. So for our referral process, LEAD has received over 300 referrals since our start in September, 2020. 
Um, we accept referrals from all community partners, including social service providers, law enforcement, prosecutors, and defense attorneys. Um, we've also accepted referrals from family members and currently enrolled lead members who have really noticed the program benefit their lives and are hoping to see their loved ones receive the same assistance. Uh, when implementing LEAD, we, married, we really tried to mirror the City of Burien's referral method, which was a more proactive and preventative approach that was really dedicated towards ensuring there was no wrong door to make a referral. And that's what we try and clarify is that there really is no wrong door to make a referral to LEAD. We really also wanted to ensure we weren't waiting for law enforcement to need to engage the individual and that law enforcement or a community partner could, such as a social service provider could make a referral at any point. So when looking at the referrals provided by local agencies, we've recently seen, been seeing the majority of referrals coming from Whatcom County Jail, as well as the prosecuting attorney's office, which I'll explain that method a little later on. Um, while we do receive referrals from local law enforcement social service providers, um, we can, I think we can really attribute the recent change of the primary referral source from being the jail and the PA office being due to new legislation in 2021, as well as staffing issues within law enforcement, most likely in Whatcom County. Um, both law enforcement and social service providers have been undergoing really a newfound territory and attempting to adapt ongoing changes in Whatcom County since that legislation was implemented. And we've also been discussing this ongoing um, matter with other LEAD programs. And this seems to really be a, a change that is occurring statewide. So, so now honing in back to that referral process. Now, once I have received a referral, I'll take that referral and bring that referral and all applicable inf information really to a biweekly operational work group meeting. And once again, I apologize for the acronym, but in the attempts of time and just expediting um, how much I'm verbalizing to everyone, I'm gonna be saying OWG. So I apologize for the acronym ahead of time. And these uh, meetings are where we go over all the historical information we have about this individual and really collaboratively come to a consensus on whether this individual would be a proper fit for the LEAD program. So when looking at the operational work group, the operational work group consists of a representative from uh, public defense, a city attorney, a prosecutor, a probation officer, program, program managers from mental health court and drug court, uh, jail staff, uh, as well as a representative from all law enforcement agencies in Whatcom County have been invited. Now, what we're looking for in terms of an eligibility standpoint is really low level law violations, um, violations that are stemming from substance use, extreme poverty, uh, as well as unmet behavioral health needs. And we have a structured actual eligibility criteria that's written out that helps us guide that path. Um, one great thing about our operational work groups right now that we're really noticing is it's we're not only getting people connected to services, but the operational work group is actually having conversations with these traditionally jurisdictionally siloed entities about confounding factors that are bringing each individual to the point of being a lead referral. So in other words, really what got that individual to the point that they are at today. So after an operational work group, what does that look like? Well, after a client is approved for lead, an assigned intensive case manager and our outreach coordinator will go out in the community and really meet them where they're at physically and metaphorically and really ask them what they need and or who they would like to be connected with uh, or who and what type of services they may need. A large part of Lee's role is really relationship building. And many of the clients referred to us have prior experience with social service programs and have historically struggled to excel in these programs and are really hesitant to re-engage for a fear of failure. So our role is really to meet them where they're at and provide an extended amount of time. We've been providing three to six months to build the trust needed to have that life-changing conversation and really try and disrupt that paradigm of the incarceration. So another method of referral that we've been currently accepting are uh, pre-charging diversion referrals, which LEAD accepts from uh, attorneys in Bellingham, Whatcom County, as well as municipalities in Whatcom County. So this method of referral is really where we're seeing the majority of referrals that are coming in from Whatcom County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. And I'll explain a little bit of this process. Um, and I apologize, Richie, if I don't explain this well enough, <laughs> you can correct me at the end. 
Um, and this is a, a new process for me as well, but when a law enforcement officer sends a case to that prosecuting attorney, that prosecuting attorney will assess the specific referral and determine whether this individual fits that eligibility criteria for lead. So if this individual fits that criteria for lead, that prosecutor will then set the charges aside and send this referral to me where they will be brought through an operational work group. And if this individual is approved by that operational work group, then the outreach coordinator will actually start outreach. This individual will have three months to determine whether they wish to enroll in lead while their charges are being set aside. So now if this individual decides to enroll in lead, then this individual's charges will continue to be set aside. In every three month time frame, that intensive case manager will have a check-in meeting with the assigned attorney to really assess engagement and also decide whether this individual's charges can, should continue to be set aside or the next steps being being charged or dismissed. Um, thus far, we've received 19 pre-charging diversion referrals. And as this is a rather new concept for us, we're excited for the future on where this can progress. All right, so what does a enrollment look like and what is the timeline for an enrollment? Well, there really is no maximum or minimum amount of time an individual can be enrolled in LEAD. We have some individuals who are enrolled with LEAD who are still enrolled since the start of the program in September, 2020. Um, if an individual is struggling to engage, we allow that individual three additional months to re-engage with ongoing outreach um, from the intensive case manager. And if that individual refuses services and no longer wishes to be enrolled in LEAD, we discontinue working with that individual and we ensure all applicable service providers are aware. So far, we've had five graduations in the LEAD program thus far. And you may be asking yourself, what does a graduation look like? Well, a graduation is a, a LEAD member, which has achieved a really a sustainable point of stabilization in health, as well as well-being. This could look like obtaining housing, um, medical services, recovery services, as well as gaining some income. Um, and that's tailored to the individual's baseline status and really has reduced, the, making sure that that individual has reduced their interactions with local law enforcement, as well as the criminal legal system. And so I'm gonna stop talking. I know you've heard probably sick of my voice by now. Um, we have actually a uh, voice of lead film. This um, really professes the program better than I ever could. It comes from specific lead members and as well as family members of lead members and how the program has impacted their lives. I'll let Melora share that. Thanks everybody for your patience with me. Just one second. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna share this, but if for some reason the sound or video is not playing, if someone can please let me know so that I can stop and try again. As a grandmother, um, I've watched my daughter and son-in-law struggle for years to find support for their son. He's very complex in his um, diagnoses. He was homeless through the winter. He was on drugs. It's been very difficult to find support for him. This organization has given us hope. My grandson is now in an apartment. He's clean and sober. And I honestly, I think this program saved his life. My name is Mackenzie Hessel. I'm an intensive case manager with the LEAD program. A lot of people in the community that we work with are dealing with homelessness, mental health, behavioral health, um, family issues, uh, substance use. It's all, it all kind of plays, plays a role. So when we meet with people, it's at their camp, it's at base camp, wherever they may be. Our clients, they need someone to walk alongside them. And that could be for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's just that the trauma that they have been through uh, makes doing those things themselves just so overwhelming that they're not gonna get it done. I went to jail and one of the officers saw that I was a good person. 
this LEAD program, reached out to him, and it was just um, literally life-changing. When you're newer to trying to find the resources you need, it can get really confusing and hard to find them and know who to talk to. Adam, Adam makes sure things, things are happening for me. You know, he really makes sure that I, I got what I need. I mean, without the LEAD program, I don't know where I'd be at. You know, 100% of my caseload, there's something else going on in that person's life. Just because somebody has, may have charges, criminal history, um, they're still a person. It really is a collaboration with police. It gives them an opportunity to say, I don't want to keep arresting this person. They just need medical care. They need behavioral health care. The LEAD program, specifically Adam Fryer, one of its social workers, connects my son, Forrest, to community services and helps him to move forward in his life. Forrest receives help filling out paperwork, handling emergencies, taking care of his responsibilities and fulfilling goals. Nearly all of us need community support, such as LEAD offers. Adam is one of the kindest people to ever enter my son's life and always lifts me up when I am concerned about my adult child. The LEAD program is going to enable clients to get off the streets and to avoid incarceration. The LEAD program is revolutionary. It's geared at getting them the help. They're people to be loved. They're not a problem to be solved. So as you can see, we ended with uh, honoring um, one of our past clients uh, and um, ended up being a, a close person to uh, one of our intensive case managers. Um, and they ended up passing away due to an overdose in September 21. Um, though this comes with the territory, um, we also understand that uh, we, we always have to make sure we're working through these and understanding the population that we're serving. Um, and figuring out how to um, be able to assess the situation and continue to move forward with serving the specific population. Thanks, Melora. Oh boy. Yep, they won't let me move forward, sorry. No, you're good. You wanna keep talking, I'll try to yeah. catch up. So what's next? Well. Um, with the new legislation that was enacted in 2021, uh, the state is helping implement a new recovery navigator program, which will act as an expansion of our, exist, of, of our existing lead program in Whatcom County. Uh, we plan to add two outreach coordinators as well as one additional intensive case manager. And we really hope to enact this expansion late summer, early fall 2022. Uh, we also have a website that I will put a plug in um, in the chat. Um, it shows all of the programs that are currently operating within the response systems division. Um, LEAD is involved and we also provide a quarterly update um, through that uh, specific website. And we send out a newsletter as well. I think that's all I have for you today. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Tommy and Melora for the presentation, the information, um, and a pretty moving video uh, of your work. That was a nice addition, thanks. Uh, Dan, I see your hand up. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can go into the, a couple of questions. First, um, can you go into um, what changes in state legislation, <clears throat> um, what the effects are on the LEAD program, just in a little more finer detail? Yeah, I think um, specifically there's been staffing changes within law enforcement. Um, I think also um, social service providers have been um, having a lot of changes as well. And so I think that's been the big, uh, big change as well as just having some more referrals coming from social service providers who are in that, in act, uh, interacting with more of these, um, these individuals that we're traditionally been serving. Laura, I don't know if you have any additional information too. Yeah, Dan, and I just, I'm not sure if you're asking about what legislation, so specifically um, the uh, changes in 2021 to how law enforcement responds to behavioral health calls, um, and then the staffing shortages with our law enforcement partners. So we've seen a drastic um, difference in the ability to 
um, get referrals from law enforcement agencies. Um, and then just in general, our, our whole community that's working together has been spending a lot of energy on making sure that we're able to coordinate services. Um, and so that, that was a big change in 2021. Can I just ask a real quick follow-up question with that, Stephen? <clears throat> um, are you talking about House Bill 1310? Yes, specifically House Bill 1310 and some of the, the other bills that, that were a part of that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, I've got Heather, Sheriff Elfo, Ryan, and Mike lined up. I'll start with you, Heather. Good morning, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay, Stephen? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but uh, Melora and Tommy, are you willing to share some of the outcomes data and how things are going for lead clients and what the difference is for people that um, don't get to participate in lead with recidivism and things like that? So we do have a program evaluation that will be coming out soon. I know Melora has been conducting a lot of work with Jeremy, Jeremy Morton, Whatcom County EMS. Um, but as of right now, we still do provide a quarterly newsletter with all of the outcomes that are included, um, specifically with those 104 um, connections to services that were included in the first quarter of 2022. Um, I'm not sure if there's any additional information that you would have, Melora, on your end. Yeah, uh, Heather, I appreciate the question. You know, we are, the, the program launched in 2020, and so we have a first, 2021 was the first year where we had a full um, data set of 12 months. And we saw a very significant um, reduction in jail bookings for people enrolled in LEAD. Um, it's over 95% reduction, uh, but we're also pretty cautious in using that data point as there have been lots of changes to um, who could be booked, COVID restrictions at the jail, staffing shortages, um, the change in legislation. So although we know that that is a significant number and it we're, we're also, uh, we wanna see that data set grow in time so that we can see, um, there's just so many factors in terms of jail bookings, but um, just looking at raw 2021 data, we see um, over 95% reduction in jail bookings for those enrolled in LEAD. So, but a big asterisk on that. So, and I'm sure Sheriff Elfo could add more detail to that. So, Sheriff Elfo, over to you. Yeah, uh, good morning and thank you for all the good work you do. It's most appreciated and most productive. Uh, just a question, uh, an evaluation of how things are going in light of the legislative changes, particularly as they relate to the, uh, the drug laws now being misdemeanors and law enforcement can't take someone into custody unless they've had two referrals. How does that work through the bureaucratic uh, process? Does it go to the prosecutor's office? Or are we referring adequate reports up there in the law enforcement community for them to send back the lead? Or are we directly referring people to lead? Or is it a combination of both? I think we're seeing a combination of both, honestly. Um, yeah, I think it's it's it seems like it's been pretty even across the board for that. Is there a preference that you have that you think things would be more effective one way or the other? You know, I I'll mean, jump in. I'll jump in here, Sheriff Alfo, in that, you know, uh, law enforcement assisted diversion and it's in the way it was created in Seattle was that law enforcement would divert um, and divert someone to services prior to needing to charge or book. Um, we aren't doing a diversion in the field right now, arrest diversion in the field. We, you know, as Tommy mentioned, are asking all of our service providers to identify people who, who need lead services, who would meet eligibility criteria and to put their name forward. So our preference is that law enforcement would be a very robust, referring entity and that they would do that, you know, as soon as they think it's appropriate. That does happen now, but we'd love to see that increase, uh, you know, but also there's a no wrong door in terms of where those referrals come from. So if it does end up coming from the jail, from a corrections deputy, that's okay too. If it does come from the prosecuting attorney's office, that works as well. But I think what we want the community to know is let's not 
let's not hesitate or wait. There's no problem in putting a name forward. We'll put them through the operational work group and see if they're a good fit. So I think the message is please, please, yes, refer. So I, I, if that answers your question. Sure. It does. Thank you very much and appreciate your work. Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you both for the work you guys do um, and the presentation today was very informative. Um, uh, two quick questions. Um, one, I know the success to, uh, I guess, reduce reentry into any sort of uh, lead system would be dependent on family support. Um, how many of the individuals that you see are from the Whatcom County area? And then uh, kind of dovetailing on that, when it comes to your workload, do you guys have enough case managers um, to fulfill the need? First question, I don't know the exact ratio of how many individuals are specifically from Whatcom County. We do see a lot of individuals who are coming in from other counties, but we also do have quite a few individuals who have been born and raised in Whatcom County um, and we're under uh, different circumstances than a lot of us here. And I think with that said too, uh, another, uh, and I apologize, your second question um, was, do we have adequate staffing? We do as of right now. I think we have always room for expansion and being able to serve, uh, continuing to serve clients. In addition to that, Malor, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I would just add, thank you, Tommy. Um, thanks for your questions, Ryan. So in order for someone to be enrolled in LEAD, we would be looking for uh, law violations and interaction with local law enforcement before we enroll. So if someone has come here from another community and word they're not known to law enforcement here, uh, it's not someone that we would take on. So now there are people who maybe have come to our community and law enforcement knows them well, and they've only been here for 12 months. Um, that would be someone that we would look into enrolling. But again, you know, it, it, we need to, they need to be involved in our local legal system in order for us to move forward with a referral. And then um, and Tommy's right, we have so far, uh, we're kind of just now reaching capacity as a program. Um, and we're about to expand with the uh, state funds through the Recovery Navigator program funds, which is our lead expansion. So that will allow us to continue to grow. I think, you know, in the next six months, six to 12 months, we could see us getting to the point where we are reaching capacity and having to um, you know, hold on referrals uh, because we don't have space on the caseloads. We haven't reached that point yet. Uh, when we do, uh, priority for referrals would be given to uh, referrals coming from law enforcement if we get to that point. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike Parker. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tommy and, and Melora for that. And it's uh, it's very good to get an update, Stephen. So thank you for, for um, asking them to do that. So some of my questions were answered, which were based on um, some of your outcomes. But one of the things that I'm curious about, and maybe this is my social worker background, I'm always curious about the ones that get away. The ones that you, that some of your staff feels like if we just had this, have there been any of those moments with certain, with clients where you, where you feel like, you know, it wasn't as successful as it could have been? And have you been able to identify any gaps, maybe beyond just the staffing and the sheer numbers of, of individuals needed for coverage? Are there resources or links to housing or are there certain aspects that you think, um, either of you think could um, make it even more effective? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I mean, if, I think that, of course, I think with um, most programs, there's going to have um, individuals who um, aren't able to as re-engage as um, efficiently or as much as you would like. Um, I think with that said, I think what we've learned most likely from the individuals who haven't re-engaged is just really having patience. <laughs> I think um, it comes with the stages of change, right? We all know about the stages of change and how long it takes for someone to um, either whatever it is, obtain that motivation or come to that realization of, oh, you know what, I do need extra help. Um, and I think also having more service providers conducting outreach and um, being able to help these individuals know that their whereabouts are known and that pe people are looking for them and care about them. I think that's um, what we've noticed is also increased engagement. Yeah, thanks for the question, Mike. Just in terms of the gaps, you know, I think this uh, task force is 
pretty well versed in some of our challenges um, as a state or in our community. Um, we know that outreach and the ability to just work with people where they're at is what is helpful. It's why we have such a long time of providing outreach and trying to build rapport with someone. Um, we also, when we return a referral because someone hasn't been able to engage, we're also able to re, you know, take that referral again if something changes or the referral comes back again. So again, no wrong door. We understand that people are at different stages and, and maybe this is where they can engage and maybe that will have to happen later down the road. So we try to be really flexible with that. Um, you know, some of our most significant challenges are just uh, both medical and mental health provider staffing shortages. Um, right now, it's for if someone needs a new patient appointment for either a medical provider or a mental health prescriber, they have to wait two to four months for a new patient appointment. Um, and so if we, so if you think about our staff being able to work with someone where they're like, you know what, I'm ready, I'm ready to deal with this medical condition, I'm ready to talk to someone about some of my mental health challenges, and then there's, we might, we're going to have to wait two to four months for even that initial appointment. So I feel like right now we're just doing a lot of direct service band-aid work where we are just trying to be with people and saying, hey, let's wait together. Let's work on other things while we're waiting for that. And then using our other programs, LEAD connects with the community paramedics. They work with the Grace Nurse Practitioner. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to also be creative in how we fill some of those gaps while we're waiting for the infrastructure to catch up with the need. Thank you both. I'm going to take my co-chair hat off and ask my own question here. I, I think that, that I'm following up on your point, uh, Melora. Uh, I think this was one of the things that struck me most talking to Tommy a while back. Um, my expectation, I think the original model was, as, as you said, on the street law enforcement refers and bang, you're into diversion and, and services. Um, so the three to six month engagement process really struck me uh, um, as, as different than I thought you were functioning. And, and so I understand part of that is a capacity issue in terms of actually uh, finding a slot in, in the services that an individual needs. Um, but that's not all of it. There, there seems to be a long trust building process too. It, it, is, is that happening in other LEAD programs? Is that something unique to Whatcom County? Um, how, how are they doing during that lengthy period when they haven't really yet committed to working with you folks? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how long a gap that is. Yeah, Stephen, one thing I want to clarify for the group is that law enforcement assisted diversion as it began in Seattle, where um, officers could say, I can book you or charge you for this incident, or I can refer you to lead, um, that in the field diversion, if the person chose to engage with lead, then an outreach worker would try to come and work with that person on scene, if possible. Um, and then that outreach team has three months to engage that person. Because even an intake can take, Tommy will tell you, an intake can take, you know, maybe three to four different interactions. It's not, you know, the, the people that we're serving are not always ready to sit down and say, yep, I'm ready to do X, Y, and Z, right? It takes time. And so even in that um, arrest diversion model, which is how Seattle started it, there was still a three-month period of trying to enroll someone. Um, so we are doing very similar. It's a very similar style. The only difference is that law enforcement is not diverting in the field but they can divert by calling Tommy and making a referral. So um, the, the charge isn't diverted in any way, but, the, um, but, they, but they could say to the prosecuting attorney, can you please consider this for um, a, a pre-charge diversion? So we haven't, I will say there's a lot of factors and we still believe we wanna get to diversion in the field and arrest diversion in the field. Um, you know, we launched in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic and all of our law enforcement partners have been 
challenged by some different factors. And so asking them to um, launch a new program where they're then doing a, having a different process in the field has not been feasible as of yet, but that's really the next step for our community to decide if, if we are ready to do diversion in the field and if that, if that makes sense. That's very helpful. Thank you, Melora. I appreciate that. Um, Maya. Excuse me, thanks. Um, yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> just give my observations on Mike's question. Um, I mean, the, there's an obvious and extreme lack of mental health services in our community. I don't think any of you are unaware of that, but that is a huge, huge, huge problem. Um, this, but this program doesn't um, and isn't maybe isn't designed to, but it doesn't address the high risk, high need population that I work with. In, and, you know, I, I participate in the, the OWG and, um, you know, I hear referrals and, you know, there's criminal history that prevents people from being um, allowed to participate in the program. And I think that is actually a gap. I think that like high risk, high need folks are actually where you see a lot of bang for your buck is how I've heard it said. And, um, and we don't do that. And I think that that's really unfortunate and something that should be looked at. And I also don't see a lot of pre-charging diversions. And I, I'd be curious about the numbers, but there were like a hand, uh, and I'm not sure if they're, I'm not see. I haven't seen them lately. There were like a few of them in the beginning, like when Eric Sigmar started attending the meetings and then I feel like they've tapered off and I haven't seen any in a while. And so the suggestion that we're somehow diverting people from the, I, I mean, maybe in, in, in the sense that they're, uh, they're not being recidivists, but, uh, the, the, and I think they're, Laura or Tommy spoke to some numbers that show the participants are not um, being charged with new crimes, but we're not um, addressing the the charging. They're, like they won't. I'm not seeing a lot of current charges being addressed through this program or benefit to um, folks for participating in terms of getting them back out of the criminal legal system. So that that's another gap I see in the program. Thanks. I see lots of wonderful work too, and I want to say that thanks. Yeah, Maya, thank you. I actually really appreciate that. And I agree with you. And I think that um, those high risk, high needs individuals that don't make it through the operational work group, it usually comes down to a, a concern for safety for staff. Um, and that's hard because our lead staff work alone in the community. So they're working, um, they can work in pairs, but often they're working just one on one in people's homes and encampments. Um, you know, doing that case management work. And so I think it's a great question to say, you know, lead can't serve every single person that gets referred. We know that we have to stay true to the fidelity of this program, but then what, what could serve those individuals that um, end up not making it through our operational work group. Damn. To what extent has the Blake decision impacted the LEAD program? I think we're still seeing changes and we're figuring out what those changes are. I honestly can't answer that question <laughs> positively uh, just because there's constant changes that are occurring um, with the legislation and where we go with that. I think um, we are still seeing referrals. Um, we're still seeing uh, clients that want to obtain treatment. Um, we're and I think with that said, um, that's what we're seeing thus far. And I would just add that, um, so someone doesn't have to have a new charge to be referred to lead, right? So um, even in the model where an officer diverts in the field, that implies that we're waiting for something to happen so that the officer can refer like the no wrong door policy for referrals is that why would we wait for there to be another legal issue? Our, we, our community knows who needs this sort of assistance and who is well known to law enforcement and has a history of low level law violations. Please put their name forward so that we can engage and not have to wait for another charge. So I wouldn't say we've seen a significant change from our end because we're not doing divert, right? We're not waiting for a new charge. So the Blake decision uh, altering the way that law enforcement was able to charge
for certain things, I, I don't think we're seeing a big shift in our referrals. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Sheriff Elfo, you're on again. I just wanted to add to Dan's comment. Uh, the Blake decision uh, was uh, rectified to the extent that the legislature thought was necessary. They enacted a statute re, uh, reinstating the, the narcotic laws. Uh, they were non-existent after the Blake decision and they were put back in place, but they changed them to felonies to misdemeanors, which is uh, problematic. And they required the two referrals before we can uh, even book anyone into jail. And, and it's creating problems with us because there's no stipulation as to quantity of drugs, primarily, uh, unless we have other evidence to prove that they're trafficking or dealing in drugs, simple possession, uh, regardless of quantity, is not sufficient to infer uh, some more organized crime or nefarious activity. But it has been fixed uh, to the extent the legislature wanted to uh, rectify that decision and its impact. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, I just wanna put a flag in a potential future conversation. Um, I think Maya's question about high risk, high need people uh, is, is something that needs to be talked about locally. Um, when we had our drug court evaluated that was the recommendation too, and uh, the biggest bang for the buck was was the the mantra there as well. Um, and yet we don't utilize our drug court in that way either. So uh, there is a group of people that we could get a lot of benefit from, get a lot of reduction and prevention of incarceration, a lot of savings of tax dollars from that we we haven't figured out a way to intervene with and and. I think that's a conversation. Barry, I'll flag that for you in the SAC process. Um, Melora, we may want to pull you and Tommy back into conversations for service models or, or ways to address that, that question uh, down the road someplace. Um, Jack. I got a two-parter. I'm going to suggest we go out of order in the agenda, and I can uh, start that if you're okay, because we have Dr. Johnson with us, I thought we could do that. I did have one comment. I really wanna highlight for everyone uh, something that Maya referred to, which is this lack of uh, mental health resources. We're not unique in this, but to have a effective system, you need all the components. It's like you can't have a production line if you don't have all the pieces. And I would say most people would agree, perhaps the largest gap is that lack of mental health resources. And I appreciated that comment being made. I don't have the solutions, but I think it's wise that we consider that as we do all these other things. Thanks. And are we, you want to thank them, Stephen? Are we good on this topic and ready to move? Yes, I, I, I was going to wrap this up. Uh, Melora and Tommy, both of you, thanks so much for the generosity of your time and coming on relatively short notice for the excellent presentation, for your responsiveness to these questions and for the, the hard work you're doing uh, that's benefiting the community significantly. Uh, appreciate the LEAD program and, and uh, who you are and what you're doing. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all. Thanks, so Jack, Mike. I will turn it over to you. I'm, I'm perfectly- you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn it right back, yeah, I think, but, but uh, Dr. Damani Johnson's here with us today. So in, uh, both respect and appreciation of his time, I'd like to move the agenda up and have that now. But I think, Stephen, you've got a little more uh, that the topic, of course, is the Washington State Supreme Court's Racial Justice Consortium Action Plan. We have a presentation from Dr. Johnson, who we're uh, grateful is here with us. But Stephen, do you want to add anything uh, before we proceed? Well, I'll just say uh, I, I don't think Dr. Johnson needs a lot of introduction in this community. He's a long time uh, professor at Western, uh, now happily retired, um, and, and, uh, and still very active in social justice, racial equity, and disproportionality issues. Um, he's, he's been involved in the, the stakeholder group working on a racial equity commission ordinance. Um, 
And he's also been uh, uh, recently uh, willing to participate in the pretrial processes work group to look at racial equity questions in the pretrial risk assessment process as well. So in the course of that, he circulated to the work group members a uh, draft report from uh, the state uh, group that he's a part of. Um, and so uh, I, I invited him to, uh, to present on uh, the work of that group. And uh, the, I think the report is final, but we'll find out uh, in just a moment. So uh, Damani, thank you very much for joining us. And I'll just turn it over to you to talk to us about the, the work of that group and the, uh, the nature of the report so far. And thank you, Stephen. Um, can I immediately say, I need like a, a two minute break you know, um, to just, you know, dispose of myself. Um, Jack, you know, caught me, um, you know, uh, kind of not ready quite to go. So can we come back in like two minutes? A absolutely. Oh, a a absolutely. Whatever is best for you. The whole goal of that was just to be whatever is best for you. And we can certainly, it'll be tough to do two minutes, but we can try. So why don't we proceed then, I think, to the budget discussion would probably be appropriate. Uh, I. I hesitate to say, I don't think this will be long. That's always, when you're facilitating a meeting, a dangerous statement to make. But uh, uh, Barry, would you like to tell us, I think you're probably best situated to let us know uh, what you need from this uh, budget request discussion. And uh, my understanding of this is this is a, a budget for the task force, for the council. And I think uh, we discussed this at the steering committee and I believe, Barry, you wanted some input from the task force on this, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I'll just give you a little uh, kind of what, what we've talked about so far. As you know, we're uh, the uh, administration right now is working on the 23-24 uh, budget, uh, the next biennium. And uh, we kind of got caught short last time. We didn't, we didn't have any requests in, and we did that final uh, placeholder for a communications consultant right at the last minute, we stuck it in. So this time around, we wanted to be much more proactive and start thinking about what kind of needs that this task force will have. Uh, some of the things that have come to light are, uh, we are gonna be challenged for meeting space uh, because there's been a lot of reconfiguration around the county as, in terms of uh, some of the meeting rooms like 514, 513 is now not available for for the task force to meet uh, as we had done in the past. So uh, when we think about trying to go back to in-person meetings at some point, that will be a, uh, a challenge for us to be able to find a spot. So we might wanna be thinking about some, putting a little bit of a budget in for uh, space rental. Jill, Jill will be tracking that and giving us some suggestions on some of the ideas that she has. Um, some of the other things that we might need uh, would be, we do have this communications consultant coming on um, and Jill can speak to that a, a little later. I don't wanna take up too much time with this, but I think um, that could be an ongoing uh, effort that would go past what the initial investment will be that the county is, is budgeting for this. So that's something that we probably wanna keep in mind. And uh, then there's always all other, whole host of other things that may come up in the steering committee discussion. So uh, I think the best bet right now, the best approach would be to be able to go into our subcommittee uh, meetings that are coming upcoming and to have that discussion in those subcommittees to be able to find out if there's needs, you know, at that level as well. So that's about all I have for today, Stephen. Um, um, I'll, I'll just add that the agenda uh, listed a couple of uh, possible topics, but I do think we uh, we need to hear from the subcommittees. Uh, the steering committee will process some of this stuff, but uh, I think the one piece of information you could add, Barry, is a little bit of the time frame for for this. Yeah, the 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 actual budget will come out from the administration in uh, around mid October. Um, so right now they are compiling uh, what the department heads needs are and are, are coming into the executive's office. So we need to be looking at this in the next couple of months, I think, uh, to be able to identify our needs. 
and be able to uh, get that into the hopper so the executive can uh, calculate that in the overall consideration of the budget. And Barry, we've got a few hands with questions. We have Heather Flaherty, then Mike Parker, and then Dan Hamm. Thank you. Um, not specifically related to this budget update, but as, as long as we're thinking about money, I wanted to bring up, um, we submitted a letter on behalf of the task force, right, regarding ARPA. And I'm wondering if it's possible to hear back from county administration at some point about where ARPA dollars ended up being allocated. Um, I think that was a, a good letter that covered some of the priorities we talked about today and needs and gaps. Um, so I just wanted to add that to the conversation. And additionally, we do have the Behavioral Health Fund and that's, I'm hearing that over and over as a high need right now. And it, it'd be interesting to know where those dollars are going as well, if that's of interest to the task force. Maybe we should be set up a, an update from the administration on, on where some of those dollars are going and how those plans are going. That, that's a good point, Heather. Thank you, Heather, Mike, and then Dan. Well, Heather said it better. That was exactly my question. I do have one tack on and uh, specifically with regards to the comments made by um, Lead and Grace about behavior health workforce shortages. Um, that was one of the key um, uh, items in the letter and specifically kind of addressing workforce shortage with the possibility of using flexible one-time funds like ARPA either for like hiring bonuses, retention bonuses, various things like that to try to draw that type of talent to Whatcom. So this is more of a tack on to Heather's uh, comment that when the update happens, it's especially like to hear um, any movement on, on workforce bolstering, especially behavioral health workforce, um, law enforcement uh, workforce. Um, and if there's not anything kind of in the books so far, maybe what the plans are to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Dan? Yeah, I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but um, the city has, um, city council has a meeting room um, in our area. And I think with just scheduling it, I think, I think if um, Jill Nixon worked with um, Malini Margaitis, um, there might be a possibility for at least the subcommittees to use that meeting space that's got technology and uh, you know whiteboard and, and such so uh, it could be good for the smaller groups i don't think it would fit the the larger task force but um but the smaller ones it could which which room is that dan it's the one in the you go into the council offices um which seems like a distant memory for me because i've only been there like 10 times in the past two years um because of the uh pandemic but it's when you go into the uh, council offices uh, it, or office rather, it's straight ahead. Uh, we share it with uh, fire inspectors and the hearing examiner um, staff. But it could be a, it could be a space where we could get get together for the groups. Thanks, Dan. Maya, do we want to talk about continuing these at least as hybrid or even continuing them remote? I I don't know if there's been like a vote or discussion mm -hmm. about this. I um, that we want to return to in person. Right? We're going to get into that at the steering committee, but okay. sir, but 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 since you raise it, my recollection is there is no plan to return to in person right away. But we actually, uh, for various reasons, have to have a physical space in order to be in compliance where members of the public can watch. I see. And I think there had to be a strategy for if when. Uh, if I capture that right, Barry, I know you're going to talk more about that in steering. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big part of it. Is is the the, there's been the restoration of the public open public meetings act. There was some there was some waivers that the governor put in place, and those are are over June first. So um, I think we're being, we're able to handle that that uh, you know that public space for the public to come in and view. But we just wanted to get this on our radar, basically, just so we we had something we had a plan in place in case that's the direction we were going to go. And I would say, my steering, we recognize how busy and far flung we are. For example, Mayor Cordheis has been here almost every meeting. It's a lot harder to drive in from Linden and to get yeah. the kind of quorum we have. We respect that, uh, and and we're, we'll try to figure out the best path forward. Great, thank yeah. you, Joe. Thank you, Jack. One thing that would be very helpful for me in planning a return to in-person or hybrid meetings would be to get a sense from the full task force of how many of you 
would like to stay um, meeting remotely via Zoom? And how many of you would like to, um, at least on a semi-regular basis, return in person? So um, we no longer have the fifth floor available to us and um, there aren't very many big meeting rooms available. So if I can get a size um, of how big of a room we need, that would be really helpful. I would like to um, put out a little bit of a poll. I'm hoping everyone can take a moment to answer that probably sometime in the next couple of weeks about what your preferences are. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. I was gonna I was gonna suggest the same thing. That's a great idea. Thank you, Jill. We'll look forward to that uh, for sure. Uh, Sheriff Elko, and then uh, Maya, was your hand up again? Which is fine if it is. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to add. Uh, I, I hope we keep the option for the hybrid. Uh, you know, normally a, a lot of the people who work for the county have busy back-to-back -back meetings and going to a remote location would uh, sometimes make us late or have to miss part of this meeting to get to the next meeting. And also like today, I'm trying to run operational things that are occurring at the same time that I could still give attention to this meeting, but take care of uh, some operational needs as they, uh, they come up, the exigencies and that type of thing. So any consideration to uh, allowing the option for, for remote sign-in would be appreciated. Thank you. Chair. And I, I just wanted to suggest that the IT has like a training room in the basement of the courthouse that might be ideal for a hybrid situation because it probably has like a screen where, anyway, just to consider it. That's a good point because we do need that infrastructure uh, to be able to do a, a hybrid. Barry, maybe with the budget or in person, you could have some donuts and bacon and things to induce us to show up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Donuts and bacon. Hey, Jack. You, you can combine them. They do that in Portland very well on Maple Bars. All right. Uh, hey, I apologize. Else? I went longer than two minutes. So I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Dr. Johnson, I believe uh, the time is yours, and I apologize for catching you off guard. I'm sorry about that. No, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, 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 Jill, uh, Jackie, you guys have that uh, slideshow that I sent you? Yes, we do. Would you like me to screen share that for you? Yes. Okay. And that will it will it be set up so that I can operate it or? Uh, no, but you can let me know when you'd like me to forward to the next screen. Uh, and okay. Can... Well, let's, let's see if I have the uh, ability to do that. Um, okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, as we all know, um, the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020 uh, raised issues of, of systemic racism, not only here domestically, but to some extent all over the world. Um, and uh, institutions and systems of all kinds uh, responded to uh, the street protests that were taking place uh, all over the country and all over the world. And on June 4th of 2020, um, the Washington State Supreme Court issued a call to action for the courts at every level uh, in the system of Washington to do whatever they could to eradicate racism in their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, following uh, that letter, uh, members of state judge associations came forward with uh, ideas for action, but there was a need, uh, uh, they felt that, that it was needed for there to be some way for these members and their ideas to be supported and coordinated in order to have an impact. Uh, a space was needed, uh, they thought, for members of the judicial branch to look uh, at themselves in a way that was accountable to the public in the state of Washington. Um, in that call to action, um, I think it was noteworthy uh, on a court in which four of the nine justices are people of color, and one is an African American, it was noteworthy that worthy that the call to action um, gave particular attention to the history of anti-Black racism in courts and other, in and other institutional systems uh, in this country. But after several months of, of engagement and so forth, a decision was made to create a consortium of representatives from each judicial branch entity, uh, from judges uh, on all levels of courts, clerks, court administrators, and community members uh, directly impacted by the justice system. Uh, this racial justice consortium was to explore and support new ideas for education, training, and identifying uh, specific areas of change um, 
within a limited time framework, something like um, a task force. Uh, you, next slide. And, and this is just part of the, the, the call for action um, from uh, the court system. Let me just add that, uh, so the membership of the consortium is about 45 people, somewhere in, you know, in the 40s. Uh, 17 of them are judges, uh, including five of, of the nine uh, state Supreme Court justices, two state appeals court uh, justices, three superior court judges, three municipal court judges, and three tribal court judges. In addition, there are 22 others working in administrative offices of the courts or associated legal agencies, such as the Office of uh, Civil Legal Aid and the Access to Justice Board and the Commission on Children in Foster Care. And then there were uh, designated to be 16 um, community members uh, for each from each of the four quadrants of the state. And um, uh, when I, when, as I looked at the membership, I could see nine or 10 people who seemed to be these community members, including myself. Uh, but I think that some of these people were, were in some of these kind of other agencies that had something to do with, with, with the courts or legal uh, uh, representation were considered to be community reps. Uh, since they weren't directly state employees. So there was about 45 people all together. Um, and just from the way I described it, you could see that it's pretty top heavy with, with, with judges and people who work in the courts. But at the same time, there was this concern and call for, for some input from, from those outside of the courts to, to make the courts more accountable. So that's, that's kind of an interesting structural thing uh, to, to think about going forward. And let me also add that most of the people, and of course you do the optics test and you, you, you look at people's names and everything. And we know that the race uh, or the identification of race has to do with <laughs> how people look and how you think they look. But I, I would say that the majority of the people on this commission are people of color, I would, a bare majority, like maybe 60% uh, are people uh, of some color. The consortium was launched officially in March of 2021 and began later uh, to, to meet later that month. Uh, meetings were or have been once a month for four hours, usually on a Friday afternoon. And uh, the agenda uh, for what was to what what was to be undertaken uh, was, um, you know, developed by the Supreme Court and the Washington Minority Justice Commission which is a number of people of color who uh, have been organized for quite some time uh, to raise uh, the same kinds of issues around institutional systemic uh, racism or inequity within a court uh, and legal practices. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so the purpose. Uh, to educate our, our workforce and meaning that the workforce force of the courts, including uh, Supreme Court justices and other judges uh, on the causes of racism and how it shows up in the courts and the legal system. Uh, a comprehensive review of specific areas of our court system that contribute to racial disparities, system racial, systemic racial injustices and perpetuate harm and then meaningful reform of policies and practices that can be measured and tracked uh, for accountable pr uh, progress. Uh, next. And this is just a timeline uh, for, for the work of, of the consortium uh, beginning uh, uh, last March. So it's been over a year now, um, but uh, up until this, this coming spring. Uh, next. So for the first uh, three months or so, we were involved in what you might call community building. I mean, there's a, a, a real, I mean, in, the, in this day and age, um, concerns about trust and being able to work with each other uh, with, with, with comfort um, and so forth are, are, you know, I think people who are in power in, in these major institutions 
uh, are more aware of that than they've ever been before. So we spent a, quite a bit of time on community building and, and, and with training related to that, uh, just having us all in these same suites and so forth and getting comfortable with dealing with each other and making sure that people are on the same page re regarding reform of the courts. Uh, and so this first, um, so, uh, and all of that was pitched in, in, in around a rubric of belonging, right? And um, what we would, what we did was to hear from people who, you know, were like social workers, those kinds of people, people who were in, in counseling, in the world of counseling and all that kind of stuff, um, talking about this sense of belonging. And then we would do breakout groups uh, to have discussions about that. And the, the, the end goal here was thinking about just, you know, the courthouse itself as a site of the administration of justice uh, and, and then uh, the attendant court system uh, to make it a feel more welcoming uh, uh, and accessible uh, to those who uh, find themselves needing to be there. Um, and so uh, this, this belonging though then became the first of, uh, of a series of reform areas, but we kind of took this up first and then um, um, moved on to some other things um, going forward. Uh, next. Uh, and then, and then, then out of that, then a, a series of commitments uh, uh, was developed. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but you know, that we're accountable to one another, that we create a space to learn together uh, a space of belonging where all voices are heard, safe space, a judgment-free zone, some, some, some room for humor and, and lightheartedness and so on, and, and a commitment to um, a multiracial consortium uh, whose leadership includes uh, those furthest from justice. And of course, anti-racism again, uh, to sum all of that up. Uh, next. And then uh, at the end of that process, uh, agreeing on a vision, you know, as uh, all organizations have to have these sorts of vision statements and mission statements. Uh, Washington State Courts are, are places of equity, fairness, and justice for all, and the mission eradicating racism to ensure justice in every instance, in every courthouse. So broad sweeping language, you know, um, ambitious language, you know, and I, I'm talking to a bunch of people who um, uh, work on the detail. I mean, this is all sounds very nice, but you know, I mean, so how do we actually do it? I mean, and you all are the folks who who are, are doing this sort of thing every day. Um, but um, so this is fine language. So what comes uh, next is, is, is the question. Uh, next, please. Uh, racial equity toolkit is something um, that then uh, the, the folks at the Minority Justice Commission and so forth uh, are using, and uh, I'm not gonna read through all that. I, I, I'm, I'm talking to a group of people who probably are familiar with this uh, racial equity toolkit. Am I right, Barry, Dan? I think that the city of Bellingham and, and, um, and Whatcom County have, have joined uh, GARE um, uh, and and I'm and I'm I'm mentioning Gare now. I'm forgetting with oh yeah, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Is that right, guys? Yeah, that's right, Damani. In fact, I'm going to give when we do our uh, kind of our committee updates. I'm giving a, a little update on on what we've discussed on Gare. But you're right, the county has joined Gare, and we're uh, now we're working on implementing that into our operations. Yeah, and and so and so you probably seen this racial equity toolkit then and there's a link there at the bottom it's a and it's a it, it, it's you know they, they got smaller documents that are one or two pages long to kind of su summarize these these six steps here and um and then there's like a 50 page you know paper um that that um, really lays out what gear is all about and i'll come back to that because what what they then did uh we got we got you know uh introduced to the to the toolkit but then what they did subsequently was kind of draw from it um in in um you know sort of um uh directing our work going forward okay next 
Uh, and so, and so then by uh, the summertime, um, we began to work uh, on these, the five areas that you see here, uh, child welf welfare and dependency, uh, the youth justice system, uh, sentencing, legal financial obligations, and, and reentry. And we basically took about one meeting, so one four hour meeting on each of these. And so that was over about five months. Um, okay, next. And um, so, you know, you know and, I, and, I'll, and I'll be honest, um, this has been directed by the Supreme Court and other people in the state court system. So uh, we didn't develop uh, 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 this issue area, but as I say, most, the majority of the people who are on this consortium are people who work in the courts. And a lot of them are involved in this min minority justice uh, commission. And, and so that was what was driving it. Um, and uh, frankly, like, like people my, like myself, we, we didn't, there wasn't, there was some questions about, so, you know, should we, should there be some other sorts of things here? But uh, the folks who were facilitating it were just walking us through it. And really basically people were just kind of receptive to these areas of focus. And, and one of the things that, that we might ask uh, you all uh, as community uh, stakeholders uh, in, in Whatcom County, is, uh, is there something else that should be here, frankly? Uh, but, um, and and we'll, we'll leave that uh, to, to the end here. But, that, but that, that's the question that can be raised, I would say. And, and I will say that it was driven by uh, particularly the people of color who are on the state Supreme Court because um, the five who, had, who the, all four of the people of color justices are on this, and then, uh, and then one other white one, um, uh, Barbara Madsen. Uh, so anyway. That was kind of the power structure of the situation, uh, but but you can see here. Uh, so and we and we did it each month. We uh, approached uh, the topic the same way. But we would have it was a, a four hour meeting. We usually have like up to a two hour presentation by people who are advocacy folks and experts. Some sometimes scholars in the field. Uh, some of the advocacy people were people who, who themselves have been, you know, uh, you know, uh, victims of. Uh, the areas of of inequity within the system, and so a couple hours of that, and then and then we would break out into smaller groups and talk about what we heard, and start to develop well what what kinds of um, reforms would be good here, and then when you all know how that uh, that stuff all works out, then you, the whole group comes back together, and you get a, a, a whole laundry list of things that might be um, addressed. And then, and then we kind of left that that way. And then, it, and then, just a couple of months, about three months ago, we came back to all of them. And you would have, like, for instance, in child welfare, fifteen or twenty different things there. And then they asked us, okay, uh, prioritize three, and you do breakout groups and and and, and come up with three. And, and and in every area, recognizing that you know there's other this other stuff that's maybe equally as important, but you just have to make some decisions like that. So I want you to be aware that that that, that was kind of the process uh, and the way it unfolded and, and the way we came up with what we did. But um, and so you can you can read these here. Um, and um, so if the again if if you think that there's maybe something else that could have been there, uh, you know, uh, there'll be an opportunity for, for some input that way. Um, uh, next one. And then uh, youth justice uh, was uh, another area of concern, examining youth systems to ensure that they're designed around more recent brain science specific to ACEs and youth development, reduction, reducing the use of detention and, and change for probation practices to divert more youth out to community partnerships and examine the ways the juvenile justice system reinforces the, uh, the expectations of the adult system. Um, uh, next, and then sentencing. Um, again, expanding the use of more incentive-based and divergent models to address behavior and the underlying needs uh, of individuals to expand successful rehabilitative elements of juvenile courts uh, to adult courts, 
and to interrogate the ways that plea bargains are efficient tools in upholding systemic racism. Uh, next. And then legal financial obligations, uh, which uh, I, you know, uh, this, is, this is like a, a huge area and, and um, it's, that was kind of eye-opening for me. Um, uh, but to eliminate LFOs ex except uh, for victim restitution, uh, which needs to be tailored to the circumstances of individual victims and defendants. And to eliminate incarceration altogether as a penalty for, for non-payment. Uh, and to eliminate LFOs altogether for juvenile offenders. And then there's quite a bit of debate about uh, uh, particularly uh, well, that second thing. Um, but um, anyway, this is kind of what we came up with there. Next. And then the, the, the whole issue of, of re-entry, um, work to expunge criminal records for youth and adult populations. Uh, before release, provide a reentry toolkit and a corresponding navigator or person to help uh, the individual as they try to make their work, they, their way back into the community. And before release, uh, provide incarcerated individuals an opportunity to engage in comprehensive shared family support sessions or trainings. Uh, next. So then, in, in the end, then the action plan calls for, and, and this is stuff that, that really comes out of the, uh, the racial equity toolkit, just, just presenting that stuff in, in, a, in a slightly different way. Education um, for the judges and, and court staff, training uh, to advance belonging and racial equity, uh, advocacy, uh, partnering with other community agencies and community organizations for collective action. Uh, and then implementation of new programs and policies, and, and with the um, the uh, declaration that we can we can start with this right now, and future measurement and evaluation uh, uh, of where we're going, so that we can be accountable uh, to, to those furthest from from justice. Um, okay, next. So. Um, and I don't know, I, I imagine a, a couple of you, some of you may have uh, listened, went to one of these listening sessions. I, mean, I sent that, that uh, announcement out to, um, to, to, to some folks on the other committee uh, uh, that, that I'm taking part in, and then just a few other people that I could think of. But anyway, um, uh, in, in that session, they kind of went through um, kind of what I just went through here. And... Uh, and then there was a, a, a call to engage stakeholders uh, to take a look at, uh, at this ac action plan. And um, so, so Jill, Jack, you all have that, uh, the plan. I, I, I sent it out, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, so I mean, you make it available to, to, to folks. Uh, I mean, because I've, I've just given you that's just a real summary description of, of, of what's there. Uh, and then, uh, Cynthia de, de, los, de los Trios, and, and I think I might not have spelled that her last name completely right there. De los Trinos, you can see it in the in the, the link at the bottom. Who's an administrative? Um, she works at the administrative office of the courts, and she she was staffing. Uh, she was one of the people staffing this whole uh, consortium process, and then they have something called an office of court innovation. Um, has has um, offered to to meet with with um, stakeholders around the state um, at some time of your convenience uh, to talk about the plan, uh, to talk about how it can be tweaked, how it can be improved upon, and then critically um, in implementation, which is is to to begin now. I mean that this is something that that. that with, I mean, uh, spreading it out, you know, uh, sharing it with folks around the state is the first step in how do you implement it? And when I said decentralized, when they said decentralized, like how, how are folks in Whatcom County uh, going to uh, be able to, 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 you know, undertake this, um, you know, the, 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 the things that are, that are being called for in the plan. Um, so, yeah, 
that's kind of it. And and so we it's a uh, that's a, a link there. I have Cynthia's email address. I thought I was I meant to put that in there, uh, but I'd be happy to put people in touch with her. Uh, I I got the impression that she she might be willing to physically come to Whatcom County, but certainly she'd be willing to have some sort of a, like a, a, a Zoom meeting or something with any group of folks uh, from this from this committee or from any of the other kinds of um, you know uh, folks that are that dealing with the the criminal justice system as it relates to issues of race. So, so anyway, um, questions. Dabani, thank you very much for that presentation and for your work on that. Um, I think there are some questions there that the steering committee here might want to take up. Barry, you might want to consider uh, overlap with the SAC process in this. Um, and I know that uh, the co-chairs of our uh, Legal and Justice Systems Committee, Raylene King and Arlene Feld, uh, are particularly interested in some pieces of the agenda that the consortium set out, uh, re-entry in specific. Um, and so that, that may be a topic for them to provide some feedback on as well. Are there any questions for Damani at this point about, uh, about the consortium, about his report? Dan, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, I guess in, in particular with the LFOs, um, sorry, it's been a kind of an intriguing area for me. <clears throat> How does it work in terms of elimination of incarceration for uh, non-payment of LFOs? Who, who is the decider on that? Would would that have to be a a, a, legis a legislative thing? I mean, well, one of the things that, that comes up is like you know the courts, you know, may have a wish list, but you know, a lot of it is stuff that the prosecutors it falls under their bailiwick. A lot of it is stuff that has to be legislatively mandated before the courts can actually do it. Um. So um. Uh, I think that that might be like, I mean, I think that's one of those things that maybe at the state level, if, if we're talking about something that's going to be operative, you know, in the state. Um, do we have any judges here? So prosecutor here. We got a prosecutor here, Eric. He's by his computer. I'm just trying to figure out to, you know, in, in that presentation, who, you know, who's tree do we have to shake here to get some of these uh good things um you know who who decides basically and, and what's the, the jurisdiction can it be done locally or can it does it have to be at the state level but that's why I'm, I'm just trying to figure those pieces out yeah i'm trying to recall that uh, there's eric he, he's he's a working man he wants us to know that, that he's on the scene um see i think you know there's a lot of i mean a, a judge can can have a lot of discretion, you know, in their courtroom about these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I mean, a legislative mandate, of course, can make things more sweeping. But Eric, do you have any uh, anything to add to that? I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to reframe the or say the question again. I was on the phone. Sure. Dan. Um, yeah, I was just asking about LFOs. So one of the bullet points said elimination of incarceration uh for failure to to uh pay a legal financial obligation and i'm just wondering who decides that is that your office that would decide that or does that need to be a state legislative decision how, how does that work right i think the best answer is the uh, legislative uh because you know we would just be able to work with our local community and i think uh, statewide is probably what the justices are looking at Thanks. Maya? Hi. Um, <clears throat> just generally speaking for folks who qualify for indigent defense, the only legal financial obligations that are imposed in superior court are, is the mandatory victim fund assessment. It's a $500 fee that's associated with every conviction for a felony cause number. That's not waivable by the court, but um, and, and restitution is not something that's waivable by the court. There's also a 
but 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 generally all the I mean there are other fees that can be imposed, but our court stri strikes them for folks that are indigent. Um, and and I don't and I think the same is is certainly true in juvenile court. And there is an understanding that juveniles who are indigent are not going to be in a position to pay. So at least there, there people have. People have LFOs, you know, $500 for one Superior Court case is significant and certainly um, accumulates. And, and I, I can't speak to the district court and the different municipalities, and they may be less um, willing to waive financial obligations, but our Superior Court's pretty good, at least where they have any discretion. So, so removing the victim fund assessment would be the one fee that really has a remarkable impact on, our, on my clients. Caleb. Um, hi, Caleb Erickson, Sheriff's Office, and uh, Dr. Johnson. I work at the jail. Um, in my experience in the last, uh, you know, 16, 17 years, uh, vanishingly small numbers of people have been incarcerated in our area for a failure to pay a fine. Um, it hasn't happened in many, many, many years um, in any jurisdiction. Um, and I hate to speak in absolutes, but we just we just don't book people around here for that. Um, we do, however, offer the opportunity for individual, individuals who have fines that they would like to work for um, day per day credit against their fines. Um, they can come into our jail alternatives building and work every day for a set rate. It's about $150 a day that goes towards their uh, fines. Um, and we work around people's work schedules and other things like that to make those things options, but we're not putting them in custody for failure to pay fines. I hope that helps, uh, at least for our jurisdiction. Yeah, and I think this varies uh, from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction around the state because uh, as other people you know, who are uh, part of this consortium who were raising it is, is, is a very serious concern. I, that may be true. Um, where it does really affect folks is licensing because failure to pay fees can result in suspensions. And then you've got this cascading effect of driving. Well, I mean, Whatcom County, you really have to drive. We don't really have public transportation for folks living in Maple Falls or wherever. And so they, they get into this um, yeah, serious problem with driving license suspended based on fines, and that can then it get aggravated over and over. So that that's that's a real problem. Um, I, I think I know my office is talking with, with West Justice Project about how we can try to work to help folks on that front, but it's it's an area that needs work. Heather, Heather, oh, sorry, that's okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, Wonderful report. I'm really excited about this work. Um, and thanks for being here, Dr. Johnson. Um, interesting about what the commentary right now about LFOs locally and what can we do locally. Um, I just want to put in a plug for the data here. And because in the absence of data and transparency and understanding about who is booked and why in our community, um, people will read reports like this and assume that all of these things are happening and that they're issues. And so I do think it would be worthwhile and I'd even be willing to help take some of this on, taking this kind of report and having a, a um, like a, a pairing, a complimentary report to say assessment of Whatcom County and what parts of these actually apply here, what are issues, what aren't, what are we doing locally? What do we expect um, for all of those areas? I think would be really great. So thank you for that. And thanks for the conversation. It's really enlightening. And thanks, Caleb, for sharing um, your perspective and Maya too on what's actually happening on the ground with LFOs. Um, I think that's really helpful information for our community at large to understand. Yeah, and, and with the, I mean, the, the, the final piece here is, is, is sort of, because the action plan is not, doesn't have a lot of data in it, okay? And there's an acknowledgement that, you know, um, we're just identifying some areas uh, with some folks who, around the state, who, who have a certain stakeholding, you know, uh, position, uh, but that data collection is now what's needed. 
so that we can so that we can know what's really going going on on the ground from place to place within the state and then you know uh make uh reforms if needed or policy changes you know that are applicable to our local situation heather thank you for offering to uh at least Take the initial steps, perhaps, in organizing a localized uh, uh, pursuit of some of those points. Dr. Johnson, thanks for your work on the consortium and, and for uh, reporting so thoroughly uh, to us about it. Uh, appreciate your joining us this morning. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's good to have Jack, you. I'm going to turn it back over to you for committee reports. Yeah, we've got a little bit of an agenda conundrum. We're going to end on time, which is in 20 minutes. <laughs> And uh, we have all of our subcommittees, I believe, have uh, met. So I want to go to Barry because I know he has some stuff from steering. And I'm going to ask that, uh, obviously, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. But if we can be brief, uh, what I'm going to try to do is go to steering. And then I think ask if there's any really uh, pressing issues for any of the subcommittees. And if not, Stephen, if you agree, we just roll over these reports to our next meeting, but, but, but make space for anything that's timely and urgent that needs to come forward today. That would, I think, be the appropriate approach. I, I do agree with that. And I noticed that Arlene's not with us and Raylene probably had to drop off for her okay. court administrator conference. So we don't have legal and justice okay. to report on anyway. Uh, so Barry, steering committee. Thanks, Jack. and. Uh, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for being here. It's very timely because uh, the first, the thing that we really uh, haven't covered today that was discussed in the steering committee is our GARE implementation strategy. And we uh, talked about that uh, at our last steering committee meeting. And we kind of had about, we came up with about five chunks of work that we're working on. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, you know, a basic thing of adding uh, an acknowledgement about racial equity into our meeting agendas as we do with the land acknowledgement. Um, so we're working towards that, um, drafting something and also going out to the uh, the uh, committee chairs out in the subcommittees to find out how they prefer to use that within their committee structure um, as they do the land acknowledgement. So that's kind of, that's specific to the task force. One of the big uh, things that we're working on is how do we implement GARE countywide? And there's, there's a number of challenges that we're working through, uh, one of which is uh, we really want to be able to serve our advisory committees through GARE. That's one of the big, one of the big uh, uh, advantages that we have. We can leverage all this information into a lot of areas of our work. But uh, some of the resources that GARE offers are only available to those folks that have Whatcom County email addresses because of the way their membership structure works. So we're working on to trying to break down some of those barriers because there is a lot of resources. I'm not going to list them, but if you do go to that GARE website, and if you just type in G-A-R-E and go to your favorite search engine, it'll come right up. And there's a tab, Tools and Resources, that talks about uh, both uh, racial equity resources and communications resources that they have. They have papers. They have testimony from, uh, from folks. They have... Uh, they have discussion articles so uh, a lot of that stuff will be uh, is interactive and we just have to figure out how to be able to serve everyone uh, on all our boards and commissions to be able to get a uh, true implementation in to the county executives to do is looking into maybe codifying some of the things that come up with into into county code we don't have any specifics on that but he spoke that was one of the things he said at our steering committee meeting that he was interested in um, and we, we really supported that effort. Um, the other thing is uh, for now, having uh, a council staff office staff member review the GARE portal and on a regular basis and be able to send out any, any information that seems relevant to our work on the task force. So um, I, I don't know if we've started doing that yet, Jill, but uh, I think that's something that's in the, in the plans. Um, so th that's really the steps that we've identified for uh, trying to implement GARE into our, into the lens of all the work that we do through our, not just our sub, or not just our advisory committees, but through staff and, uh, and all the policies the council looks at. 
uh, to be able to have that lens and, and, and go through that racial equity toolkit that Damani mentioned uh, is important to have that kind of a checklist that staff members can go through and make sure that they've looked at things in all the right uh, ways for racial equity. So basically that's an update on the steering committee. Um, the other things we talked about were budget and, and, and the things we've already talked about today. Are there any questions for Barry? All right, you're, uh, you're all making it easy. Uh, we've got 15 minutes. Uh, I see we have both Dan and Mike, so perhaps we can go to behavioral health. Mike, do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? Dan, that would be great if you did. I've got a very active toddler on my hands. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's see So we can get this straight here. <clears throat> Hold on one second. So this was a joint meeting on uh, of the Bay of Health Committee and the Legal and Justice uh, Systems Committee on April 19th. Um, we had a, a lot of people uh, present, and we had some uh, some SAC folks uh, that were there as well. <clears throat> we um, went over an update on the sequential intercept uh, service inventory and reentry services. Uh, it was a big body of work. Um, Parker gave an overview of what the SIM is and uh, update uh, and the update process that's um, and what that's looking like. Perry Maori uh, is providing. Uh, an explanation of the of the of his work for the behavioral health uh, gap analysis um, um, as it relates to the sim. There was discussion um, between the committee members and the SAC members. Um, we talked about a, a number of different topics. Um, my, uh, Brian Estes mentioned that his organization, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, is working to form a clubhouse international model in the area, um, which might help to address some of the uh, programs that are uh, identified. Uh, as needed, but not yet in existence. Um, one of the SAC members was asking about the availability of the SIM uh, prior to uh, the final version. And that's going to, I think uh, Perry sent that out to him. Um, Reentry services um, and when those might be might be offered and the importance of those services to prevent recidivism, um, where programs are or should be physically located. And this is in relation to <clears throat> um, the jail facility. So where do you where do programs, um, where are they housed, essentially? We talked about a number of different things in terms of um, the literacy rate within the jail system is uh, pretty low, and there might be some opportunities there. Um, Reentry protocols for treatment centers, including admitting uh, to treatment for competency restoration and the next steps after restoration when that's complete. Uh, Jason Smith, who's a SAC member and a public defense contractor, um, describe the difference between substance use disorder and competency restoration. Then Maya uh, <clears throat> chimed in and expanded on that competency restoration process and the delays that, that often occur. Um, we <clears throat> talked about um, individuals charged with a misdemeanor are not subject to the true blood decision. Uh, so competency restoration takes longer. Basically, um, a lot of this was really diving deep into the system itself and, tr and really trying to get the SAC members and ourselves up to speed when it comes to um, why, why do things take so long and why are they, why are they not often successful. Uh, we identified some gaps in services, including navigators who work between systems uh, that also can identify gaps. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, there was a, a member that said, um, that there could be a benefit in having a, a staff social worker on uh, his team. That was Smith, uh, Jason Smith, the person who works within the jail, um, to um, a social worker on his team in the Office of Public Defenders. Um, these employees would be able to coordinate with uh, clients and guide them to available services. Uh, we talked about options to pursue recovery outside of incarceration systems and equities uh, regarding <clears throat> gender and justice. Um, barriers to free services, and it was a pretty robust um, discussion. There's quite a bit more here that I'm not going to go into, but um, suffice to say that we covered a lot of ground. And I think that the I'm hoping that the education of those SAC members is, is starting to kind of gel a little bit. Um, 
And I think it, it's edifying our own um, understanding of how the system works um, in relation to the very complicated competency restoration, involuntary commitments, um, reentry services, all the things that are kind of the ingredients of, uh, if we do them properly, hopefully we'll be more successful. Um, and if we get them wrong, it's uh, not good. So, but I just, I guess that's my my overview. I don't know, Maya, if I um, hit the high notes on that. Okay. Mike, do you have anything to add? It's probably chasing his kid around the house. Yeah, no, my apologies. She's uh, she's pretty active. Dan, my, my only comment was, um, and, and you're right, you covered our meeting summary extremely well, um, was more a reflection on, um, on Dr. Johnson's um, presentation and how we're really in kind of in similar spaces, right? There's a lot of work wanting to know um, really about the data in our systems. And as I reflected on what he was telling us and about where the statewide group is at and looking at our state Supreme Court and our court system, just occurs to me that is a very similar pain, if you will, um, that we experience here. I think in order to move to the next step, you can adopt a toolkit, you can try to create some processes, but you really do need the data. So just teasing that piece out. The other piece was um, some hope because they're going to be tackling similar issues and similar venues that we do. So really wanting to keep ongoing communication with that group, if, if Dr. Johnson, if that's you or if there's other ways, because I think there could be things that we could learn in our own processes here. Um, and then the third point, Dan, is just to kind of celebrate those pieces. And there's not that there's a lot of wins, but there's movement. And that we may not have a lot of uh, reforms that we've generated from this work, but we've started it. And I think that's a huge, uh, that's, that's just a big step. You know, the county's taking that step, the state is taking that step. Let's do it in concert, let's do it in transparency, and let's share the information and the pain along the way as we go through this process. Thanks, Mike. We have a hand. Uh... Barry. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment on, on uh, Mike's uh, comment about data. And one of the things that we did uh, come out, came out of the last steering committee when we were talking about recommendations about budget was having a full-time criminal justice data analyst position uh, with expertise to evaluate and report on all the data that we are, we know we're missing. And, uh, to maybe to do a, a, a deep dive on all that and give us a better feel for that and work with our index committee. So that's something that we haven't developed any kind of scope for yet, but uh, the idea is definitely on the table. Thank you. Any other questions for either Dan or Mike? All right, Perry, would you like to be rolled over to the next meeting since we meet quarterly, or would you like to do a three minute report? Your call. I'm more than happy to share just a bit of an update in terms of the Crisis Stabilization Center. Um, I'll endeavor to make that within a three minute period of time. Ish, and, ish. <laughs> uh, Perry Mallory, uh, Response Systems Division, Behavioral Health and Special Projects uh, Supervisor. Um, we, uh, if you'll recall, we regularly meet as a Crisis Stabilization Center Advisory Committee. Our last meeting was on May 2nd. Um, I really wanted to speak to this today because there's been some pretty uh, exciting forward movement um, from my perspective and I'm optimistic. Um, we continue to work with and support all obviously the uh, stakeholders of the Crisis Stabilization Center, including the providers Compass Health and Pioneer Human Services in the adjustment and, and steps that they're taking to uh, maximize um, the uh, available beds. Um, and just increase utilization of that for our community. Um, one of the target goals that we had was uh, for the triage, uh, the mental health uh, stabilization side, Compass Health, to be able to secure the DOH certification for following through with our 12 hour law enforcement hold. They have successfully accomplished that certification and are now working the steps to uh, ensure that they have the staffing model that will be necessary related to that uh, Washington Administrative Code and the requirements of that certification. Um, additionally, we've been working pretty closely with Compass Health and Pioneer Human Services both, but Compass Health uh, particularly had convened a work team to really take a look at their uh, admissions process, um, especially that relative to uh, law enforcement and first responders, significantly reducing the time that those individuals were actually at the facility, making the beds available, et cetera. 
And uh, they had uh, completed an actual admissions process uh, streamline uh, update and were uh, planning on implementing that actually today. This has uh, been over a, a couple of months that they had gone through their process. And so we'll have an update in terms of that detail uh, component as well in our next uh, meeting. Um, so exciting that we're taking a look at that, the you know initial intent or primary component of the intent of being able to uh, have admissions in terms of uh, you know, first responders, law enforcement, um, being able to divert individuals uh, potentially from uh, uh, the um, ED and from uh, the jail. Uh, so we are continuing to uh, work uh, specifically on collecting referral admissions and uh, utilization data, um, as well as working with uh, uh, emergency medical systems just in terms of some of the data that they are uh, working on collecting and how that we can accomplish that. So. In a nutshell, um, that is an update in the Crisis Stabilization Center. I'm feeling pretty positive about the plans and forward movement at this point, um, and uh, look forward to reporting again soon. Well, yeah, Perry, we'll probably give you some time on the next one. I feel badly about trying to rush uh, all these important topics, but I also need to be respectful of everyone's time. Are there any questions for Perry? We got a couple minutes. I'll just say as a member of that committee, a lot of progress is being made and given that's part of the reason we originally formed quite a few years ago, it was great to see uh, how that's uh, maturing. Okay, I believe if I'm not mistaken, Stephen and Jill, we are at the point of public comment. Have I missed anything? Uh, no, if we do have two attendees at the meeting today, if either of you would like to speak to the task force, please virtually raise your hand now. Okay, well, then I just want to thank everyone for being here. A special thanks to Dr. Johnson for your time and our other presenters. Uh, we'll see you all next month. And Barry, our next, for those involved, we have a SAC meeting coming up, uh, coming up pretty soon. I think a few weeks, I guess I should probably announce that. I believe, uh, let's see, where's it on the calendar? Full SAC meeting, June 8th, two o'clock. So that's we'll, correct. We'll, June, June 8th is our next uh, SAC meeting. So that'll be on the Behavioral health uh, gap analysis. Okay. And with that, um, your Monday morning is almost over. Have a great work week. <laughs> <laughs>